the amazing absorbing boy. The story of Samuel, the teenager whose mother dies and he has to leave Trinidad to join his father in Canada. It's a portrait of big city Canada told through the wide eyes of a young immigrant. Rabindranath Maharaj is the author of three previous novels and two collections of short stories. He's been heralded notably recently by the National Post as a major writer with a distinctive, fully formed voice and sensibility. High praise. Let's listen to Rabindranath. Sometimes when I was sitting on the third floor of the Toronto Reference Library, <laughs> gazing down at the street, I would imagine what my friends at my Arrow Composite School in Trinidad might think if they could see me here. At that school, the library doubled as a detention center where delinquents had to spend an hour after dismissal doing nothing in particular while one of the male teachers chatted up the librarian. A mobile library came once a month in Mayawa Junction, but there was usually a line of drunkards demanding picture books on diseases and witchcraft in outer space. In any case, my uncle's book, my uncle's shop was stocked with comics, so I had little use for any type of novels. This library, though, this place, though, was different. There was an elevator with glass sides that went straight up to the fourth floor, where hosts of people sat before their computers. It wasn't long before I would head straight for the third floor, where I discovered there were Caribbean storybooks, comics, movies, thick old books with mostly pigtails, and here two computers all over the place. I sampled all, moving from place to place, watching boys my age concentrating on their monitors. I wondered how many of them were on a six-month visitor's visa that would expire in 21 days. This always brought me back to Earth and I hung around the weekend seminars on the first floor before I got distressed and bolted to some other spot. One day I plucked out the Caribbean storybook and flipped through its pages, searching for some reference to my village. I heard someone say, a mediocre little island. I glanced up and saw a man I had almost stumbled on the step the previous day. The man continued, they think they're smarter than anyone else, the presumptuousness of silly little islanders, mud hut folks. And who asked you that, I thought. But I said nothing, because this fellow looked as if he was working here. After a minute or so, I got a little uncomfortable, because he was still looking over my shoulder. When I went to replace the book on the shelf, I saw him staring at me. During the week, I forgot about him, as I had other things to occupy my mind. But on Saturday, he appeared once more and told me, I have seen you hanging around the seminars, but you always leave halfway. Could he be some kind of library police, I wondered? I look up for a good glance, and to be honest, he was one of the ugliest persons I've ever set eyes on. There was nothing wrong with any particular feature, but the way everything was patched together gave the idea of a man who had no use for friends. Without any invitation, he bold-facedly pulled a chair next to mine and told me, Yesterday, a boy jumped off the fourth floor. He landed right there. He pointed in the direction of a square enclosure filled with plants. What happened to the boy? I asked him. Exactly what one would expect when a body lands on its head. He told me, every month someone tries to commit suicide here. You mean the book's so boring, I said. The minute the words left my mouth, I regretted saying them. This fellow didn't look as if he approved of jokes, particularly of tragic topics. I tried to cover up by asking him, but why here? Why in the library? One does not know, he told me. One can only speculate. Perhaps there's a special gravitas to expiring in a place like this. In the case in question, the victim was a refugee claimant who received news that his parents had been murdered in his home country. He dabbed away some oil that had leaked on his huge forehead and wiped his hands on his jacket. I'm leaving in two months, you know. Why, I asked him. He told me, everything has changed. Now the entire staff is beholden to list. Horrible memoirs bursting with frivolous grief. I feel sometimes as if I am a custodian of misery. But to answer your question, I'm, I'm leaving because I've been pushed out. By whom, I asked? By my advancing years. In two weeks, I will have reached my retirement age. There's just one regret, just one. I began a poem on August the 16th, 1984. It was my first day in the library. 
It must be very long, I told him. It's two lines. I would have laughed if he wasn't so serious. The first line he told me is the snow piffles. The second line written the following year is like orphan kittens. For 23 years, I've been searching for the third line. Thank you. Retournons au nominé francophone. Laisse-moi te dire est un recueil de lettres pour chaque âge de la vie. L'avant-propos commence par ces mots. C'est en vivant qu'on apprend la vie. J'aime beaucoup ça. Ensuite, l'écrivaine partage avec nous simplement et tendrement ses réflexions sur le sens de l'existence. Il n'est pas étonnant alors que l'écrivaine soit détentrice d'une maîtrise en philosophie. Muriel Beaulieu a publié deux récits. Elle est avec nous ce soir, s'il vous plaît, Muriel. Lettre à la jeunesse. Salut les 21 ans. Salut la relève. On a tant chanté la jeune vingtaine. C'est le printemps de la vie, dit-on. C'est l'heureux temps des fleurs avec sa promesse de fruits. C'est la page vierge susceptible de toutes les possibilités. Vous voilà donc pleinement au monde, vous voilà en possession de vous-même. Tous ces lieux communs, vous les avez entendus, j'en suis sûre. Ils laissent croire que la vingtaine est une décennie où il n'y a que de la beauté, de la vigueur, de la lumière. Or, il n'en est rien. Ce discours s'appuie sur une sorte de tableau idéal. La réalité est tout autre. C'est bien vrai que vous éprouvez un élan qui voudrait tout bousculer, tout refaire. Mais tout se fait par petits pas sur cette terre. Vous le savez déjà. Ne vous croyez pas anormaux s'il vous arrive de baigner dans une certaine tristesse. Si vous doutez de vos forces, si vous vous sentez vulnérable malgré tout ce qu'on dit de vous. Vivre est un labeur, à votre âge comme aux autres âges. Vous aussi, vous avez des journées remplies de petits et de grands enchantements, de petites et de grandes misères. Nous sommes tous des sujets en transformation continue, tantôt jubilants, tantôt souffrants. Être la relève ne change rien à cette vérité fondamentale. C'est une fierté, bien sûr. Vous tentez de relever la tête. Vous tentez d'être à la hauteur. Puis, la semaine suivante, vous prenez conscience des obstacles, du fardeau. Vos reins ne se montrent pas aussi solides dans le concret que dans le rêve. Vos pas hésitent, chancellent. Vous vous demandez où vous allez aboutir. Tout est à deux tranchants. Études, travail, amitié, amour. Nous essayons de naviguer au milieu de tout ce vécu. Il faut un certain équilibre pour ne pas perdre le gouvernail. Je n'avais pour ma part pas suffisamment d'équilibre. Je me sentais toujours sur la corde raide. À un moment donné... J'ai fait naufrage. Ken Sparling's work is often described as experimental anti-narrative pieces that push literary boundaries and confound the reader's expectations of the very act of reading. Case in point, his latest book, Book. Let me share with you a little extract of an interview he gave to Broken Pencil last year. This is what Ken said. I hope book belies all expectations, both for people who've never read anything by me and for people who have. I hope book sets up certain expectations in the opening lines and then goes on to crush them. I hope that in the wake of their crushed expectations, readers experience a sort of resurrection of expectation. And I hope these resurrected expectations are subverted by the end of book. I hope that by the end of book, readers can't quite figure out what happened to them, but are glad it happened. So I thought I might help prepare you for what you're about to hear. <laughs> Please welcome Ken Sparling. She lowers her hand to the cup, lifts the cup to her lips, sips. She licks her lips, 
small curls of steam pass her nostrils. She looks like a woman who has forgotten what she was going to say. The kitchen is white. A plastic clock hovers over the sink. In the story, I am unable to escape. I am a common device. Try as I might, I cannot escape. In other stories, I have often been successful in eluding capture, but not this time. In this story, everything has already been written. Flo's granddaughter, Juliet, breaks down, cries. She has never seen a person in a coffin. She sees certain things she has never seen before. She sees strange things. She sees things hidden in the moment and they make her cry. After a number of years, someone else dies. This leaves Juliet alone. She doesn't know what to say. She sits at a kitchen table. A woman holds her fingers to her lips. Another woman scowls, looks angry. She looks like she is burnt out, but about to say something. Thanks. <laughs> Andre Christensen from Ottawa. She has written a novel called La Mémoire de l'Aile, unable to be with us due to some scheduling issues, but uh, let's just applaud her nomination in that category as well. Her book is published by Ladies of Stone, uh, David, and it's the same case for another of our nominees, Michel Dallaire, uh, a poet who has written a collection called L'Autre en moi t'écoute. Uh, it's a collection, it's his 14th book, and he's done seven collections of poetry. Michel, unfortunately, not feeling so well tonight and unable to attend this evening. So again, let us together congratulate Michel Dallaire and tell you that uh, pendant que l'autre moi t'écoute est publié aux éditions L'Interligne.